Uh, great, thanks, Neil, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Dane and I are really happy to be here today to give you a walk through and update you on what I think is a pretty amazing story from Optimize Health and why we feel that what we're doing here uh, is life-changing. So when we talk about life-changing medicine and supplied by nature, uh, hopefully you'll feel compelled after we go through uh, our updates that you would agree that that's kind of where we're at in our evolution. So our facility that we uh, have our world-class cultivation uh, in GMP level is in Princeton, British Columbia, which uh, I like to point that out because a lot of people, when we say that we manufacture in Princeton, they think Princeton, New Jersey, uh, but Princeton's a, a really nice little town in, nestled in the mountains and valley uh, in the Thompson, Okanagan, or actually I would say just to the side, it's more to the Smilkameen Valley, uh, but a great place. It's been a wonderful community in terms of embracing us and welcoming us there to set up our business. Now, <clears throat> when we talk about sort of what, what what's really the, the purpose and the vision for where Optimi was hoping to go, and then today as Dana and I update, you're going to see where we're actually at. Uh, a key element as we were building out the business is that we wanted to make sure that we were in a position to produce uh, scalable, natural when we talk about mushroom formulations, that's both functional and psychedelic and really to transform human experiences. I think the important part in the vision and the place that we really paid attention to was this whole notion of being able to create a GMP facility uh, built from the ground up that was going to set us apart. And it's an important supposition. And I say that because uh, Dane, myself and a few others from management and, and those of us in the psychedelic space, had a really important call with Health Canada on March 24th. And part of it was just a bit of a grounding and an update from them in terms of uh, pathways to access uh, psychedelics through the special access program, clinical trials, and uh, Section 56 special exemptions. The piece that stood out for us in the call and really spoke to where we think we're going to be differentiating with Optimi is, and th these were words direct from a Q&A uh, to Health Canada, and it was somebody had asked the question about saying, well, what quality standard needs to be there for any of the above pathways, whether it's a clinical trial, special access, or a section 56. And these were Health Canada words. It needs to be a GMP produced psilocybin product. I mean, that is kind of what's expected. And the supply of that, that's sort of the standard. And I'd say that's key because when we look at sort of what we're doing at Optimi, and I'm gonna turn it over to Dane to talk a bit about saying, uh, you know, why do we feel that we're a step ahead? And uh, with that, I want to turn it over to Dane, who's one of our founders and also the chief uh, marketing officer and a director on our board. Dane, over to you. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Bill. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Um, so, you know, going back to when we founded this company, um, you know, we're, we're ambitious guys. We saw an opportunity with, uh, you know, what was going on in the space to really be the first scalable um, GMP producer of natural psilocybin. Um, you know, I've had my own personal experiences with psilocybin that were really positive. And, um, you know, I, I think that we're, we're at that point where we're going to be one of the first companies to legally supply, you know, natural magic mushrooms directly to patients. Um, so we're kind of at that tipping point now where we're seeing decriminalization around, you know, around the world, really, and, and a lot in the States. So, um, you know, as those dominoes start to fall and those doors start to open, um, we're finally at that point where, you know, we're, we're going to hopefully bring some value to patients and, and our shareholders. Um, you know, really proud of the facilities that we built. Um, you know, a year ago it was a story and, and um, you know, our IPO, and now it's becoming a lot more real. So we are calling this year the year of our commercial, year of commercialization. And, um, you know, as they say, build it and they will come. And now we've built it and now they're coming. So we're seeing a lot of, um, you know, positive, you know, interest from groups around the world for what we have going on. We, we searched high and low for um, natural psilocybin for our own clinical trials. We couldn't find it. Um, so we're starting to see some of the interest, um, you know, come our way now that we're we're actually cultivating our mushrooms. Um, so I'll leave it there and and uh, pass it back to Bill. Uh, no, thanks, Dane. And to the point that Dane just made, when we talk about the opportunity, and I see that some people are already as asking a few questions, and I think this will start to answer it. Is, you know, where where do we see the opportunity? Well, we've got our state of the art facilities uh, built ready to, and we're literally growing our first grow, crop of psilocybin mushrooms as we speak. The 
a, there's a few areas that we see the opportunity. The first is big pharmaceuticals. And I, I started my career 30 years ago with Procter & Gamble in the pharmaceutical and healthcare division. So I have perspective in knowing that when there's a new category that's of interest, the venture groups and pharma companies start to look. And then if they see something interesting, they go to molecular discovery. In doing that, there's a lot of interest tied into, especially markets for depression, anxiety. And I'm going to talk to the, what the size of those look like a little later. But that's the attraction for big pharma. And if they're they're convinced and we're seeing a lot of interest already, even with the inquiries we're getting inbound, that using natural psilocybin products, even to uh, create products, uh, pro-drugs in that, uh, it's a fairly significant demand that there is, even at the discovery stage. And then if you get into phase one, phase two, phase three, you need product. Our, our basically supposition is we're going to be the provider and supplier of that GMP natural uh, pharmaceutical grade psilocybin to any of those uh, entities that need it. The other piece that I would tell you is that the opportunity right now in psychedelics and the amount of research being done around the world is enormous. I mean, there's over 600 sites around the world that are conducting research, and many of them are doing multiple studies. Uh, this, the molecule from a psychedelic standpoint being most studied is psilocybin, and the choice is actually natural psilocybin over synthetic, and, and again, speak to that a little uh, later. Uh, but the other part is that we see that there's just unmet opportunities all tied into the clinical side, then getting right through to the patient. But then also in certain jurisdictions in the world, there's already, I would say, a lot of momentum, momentum towards a recreational or medicinally licensed, which I think is actually more realistic and some of them Canada included. Uh, that's where we see lots of different opportunities. And even as we've just really started uh, pressed play, in the last few days on advertising to the world that we're open to start uh, producing psilocybin mushrooms for their purposes. Uh, we're already seeing the inbound requests uh, fill up quite a bit. So the piece that we think makes us stand out is also the technology that we're using in cultivating the mushrooms. And part of it is, and when you see our facility, and again, one of the questions asked is, are we gonna be opening that up to show? So mark your date, May 27th, uh, of this year, we're going to be doing our ribbon cutting event in Princeton, British Columbia, and of which case we're also going to live stream. So you'll have the opportunity to actually see the inside of our facility, everything through from uh, the incubation chambers, the grow rooms, uh, the drying rooms, the processing, extraction, right up to packing. Uh, it, it's state of the art. And what, what we're really speaking to here is the state of the art in, in the mindfulness that was done from design right through to the building being up and running now. Uh, the advantage that's gonna give us is because of the investment that we've done in putting the state of the art building, it's also to make sure that we can have a repeatable process and get towards the ultimate goal in any cultivation product, which is perfect genetics. Dane, anything you want to comment on this or I thought I heard you. Yeah, I would just say, you, you know, we're, um... You know, it's just really exciting. Um, you know, obviously a big part of our CapEx uh, was putting these facilities together. And, and from here on in, it's really just about commercializing them and, you know, adding a few key pieces. We just added our grower um, who's, you know, super experienced. I think we're going to do a bio on him. And um, I know he's not in the deck, but, you know, just a, you know, a, a really exciting time. Oh, thanks, Dane. So when people ask me, and they do all the time, if you had to describe Optimize in a few words. I, I would I would leave you with this. It would be natural, scalable, and accessible. Natural because of our commitment to uh, natural based products, uh, both on the functional and the medicinal psilocybin and psychedelic side. Scalable. This is an actual picture of one of our ten thousand square foot facilities, and from what we've done in terms of scrubbing the landscape of the world, to seeing who else could potentially do what we do. Uh, where we want to be the best, we're seeing that nobody, while there might be people that are able to grow, none beyond something beyond the bench or tabletop of uh, the one that I'm presenting from today, uh, whereas ours with uh, dedicated grow rooms, uh, half dozen of them, including the incubation room, everything under one roof and another 10,000 square foot facility that as the demand hits that we could light up and, and put for that capacity as well. So it, it's a key piece. We talk about accessibility because we would like to position that there's several different ways that we're going to be able to work with clients and uh, 
uh, depending on what their need is, whether it's a B2B, if it's somebody that's actually drug formulating themselves using the natural psilocybin on the R&D side and or straight through to patient, because uh, we'll basically be doing the packaging uh, and all the other elements, I'd say, involve right through to the end supply to a patient as in the example, and we expect to see these come through within Canada, the special access program, where our finished product will end up in the hands of a patient under supervision from a physician. So when we talk about, again, the opportunity, uh, the <laughs> I'd say pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, the opportunity in terms of all the different comorbidities where psychedelics and psilocybin in particular have been seen to be highly effective and are being researched and tested. Everything from smoking sensation to substance abuse uh, to uh, inflammatory conditions, as well as anxiety, PTSD, which uh, quite frankly tends to be huge, tremendous markets. And one of the other realities is, is when you look at the supply chain and the psychedelic supply chain, while there's a lot of pharmaceutical companies I think, as I mentioned earlier, if you're going to, and a big pharma company decides that they're going to invest in really trying to understand and do molecular development of some prodrug with using natural psilocybin as the base, they need raw supply. The raw supply needs to be something that's at an EU GMP standard, and we are really the ones at scale that would be able to meet that demand. So that that's a pretty key piece. And then, as I also mentioned earlier, while today, when you look at sort of the total output of between synthetic and natural psilocybin, of the psilocybin that's available for study purposes or even human consumption right now, 85% of it today, but this is because we're not up and running in that scale, is synthetic in nature. Uh, natural is growing. And we know based on the requests we're getting, literally where people have been using synthetic, uh, that they're asking to say, can you replace and, you, and provide a natural product for our clinical trial or to be put into a patient application for SAP or other uses in different parts of the world? Dane, did you want to uh, comment on this one? Um, nope. All good. Thanks. All right. The other part that's important is we're, we're, it's not been lost upon us at Optimi, and I'd say others in the space, on public perception. Before the Controlled Substance Act in the 70s would, was put into place, psychedelics had somewhat of, a, I'd say, bad press. And, and in particular, unfortunately, and in, in recent uh, studies here from Nano sort of supports it, uh, most of the bad press was tied to LSD. Uh, psilocybin certainly had some, uh, but it was a little more on the fun side, and you certainly didn't hear of people jumping out of windows or dying, uh, taking too much psilocybin. Uh, and that's important because the public perception that when, when you're looking to see and, and get uh, medical acceptance. The first part is you need studies that are going to show safety and efficacy. And there's a lot that are conducting that. And again, we're the ones supplying and will be supplying the, uh, the natural psilocybin. But the important part is that the public perception is that they don't see it as something that's bad. And the Nanos research certainly suggests that the net score overall, in terms of people's perception of being approved and wanting to see that there's opportunity uh, is high. So this this was a great point for us to see. And again, further supporting what we do. The other piece in this, again, when we talk about the meeting that we had with Health Canada on March 24th, and they talked about the opportunity for safe supply, really that's going to be where we see ourselves uh, having the game-changing ability. And that is because for all of the different conditions that are being researched and studied, it's been interesting that as these studies through the years have been getting approved and certainly more in recent time, nobody was actually really talking about saying, well, where are you getting the product from? And it, it's a bit of a tough situation in Canada that if somebody was to receive a section 56, which basically comes right from the minister of health, then they were, the patient was effectively left on their own uh, to basically co find product. Uh, and that's a bit problematic. So, we're positioning ourselves, we're already listed as a, a supplier through Health Canada, uh, but really to be the key individuals or the key company that's going to be supplying uh, safe supply through the clinical trials right through the patients. So when we talk about sort of the different groups that we have, 
uh, we have a couple, three really distinct groups within ourselves. One is the labs, which is really where we do the bulk of our research and development, uh, as well as we've got a state-of-the-art analytical lab. This is an actual shot, by the way, inside our facility at Princeton. If you can see, again, when we talk about technology, the state-of-the-art Argus system, the HVAC systems, the security uh, cameras, which are in effectively every single uh, room, nook and cranny, which is something you're asked to do as a, uh, to be a dealer of a controlled substance. Uh, but for labs, this is where on the cultivation side and also the extraction side that we're really investing on uh, and with our chief science officer, Justin Kirkland, uh, who comes with a tremendous amount of experience in the space, trying to, I'd say, uh, answer questions to the scientific curiosity, but importantly to say, how can we grow and provide the best psilocybin products uh, in the world? And, and that's really where we've been putting the bulk of our focus through the lab. The farm is actually our cultivation facility, which again, the picture before showed. I think an important note, because uh, we've been asked this now a couple of times, is basically saying, you know, what once you're at full scale, what's your capacity? Uh, we have the ability on a monthly basis to grow upwards of 2,000 kilograms of psilocybin containing mushrooms and or functional mushrooms because we're also getting demands for different uh, species of functional mushrooms as well as the psilocybin. Uh, but I would say you'd be hard pressed to find any facility in the world that could produce that kind of capacity. And by the way, that's dried fruiting body. Um, so it's a tremendous amount and impressive in that when you see the virtual tour at the end of May, we'll show you what one of the grow rooms looks like with uh, the floor to ceiling vertical racks. Uh, and it's a fairly low touch process, uh, but pretty exciting when you see a room full of mushrooms. And the last one that I was gonna share is our nutraceuticals, which we are uh, very proud of our product lineup. Uh, again, because at Optimi as a health and wellness company, we, we really do promote all things fungi. And we've got a great product line that's out um, for sale as we speak. Uh, we think what makes our products set apart, we believe in the whole fruiting body uh, as being really the, the core material that needs to be used. And check us out on optimylife.ca. And the best way to, and I think we've got a link actually in the presentation, but uh, to see the products that are available today. And we're really happy with the way that the uptake has been. So when we look at what's our revenue model going to look like, and again, one of the questions I saw early saying, okay, so we know where your share price is. What are your intentions to really change that and do differently? Well, part of it is between the nutraceutical lineup being out the door, uh, as well as us now being open for business when it comes to being able to sell our psilocybin containing mushrooms. We really see uh, four different ways that we're going to be creating revenue. So the first is uh, clinical trials. And again, there's hundreds being conducted around the world, even since sort of announcing to the world in the recent uh, weeks here that we are available to be a supplier. We're getting a lot of inbound inquiries in that regard, and I don't expect that to change. The special access program that I touched on in section 56, uh, that's under a medical supervision here in Canada, uh, where a physician can uh, set, put an application in on behalf of the patient to request psilocybin. I don't see this as huge volume today, but it is still going to contribute. What it really sets the framework for is getting Health Canada comfortable that there is an opportunity and hopefully to move down a path sometime in the future here for medicinally licensed or legal that an opportunity for, I'd say, greater use in an application. That's what we're hoping for. And then on the retail side, uh, as I just mentioned and showed our nutraceutical lineup was out the door. Uh, we're starting in Canada. We're getting demands in different parts of the world. Australia's shown an interest, same with the UK. Uh, but really, I think the next market we would go into and probably either later this year or next is the United States, uh, where there's a, a fairly significant demand for functional mushroom products. And we feel that our lineup would really stand out. And the last piece is on the R&D and analytics. So as I said, we're building a state-of-the-art analytical lab in Princeton, British Columbia. Uh, one of the things on top of being able to pr produce our own certificate of analysis is we can do that across other botanicals, including cannabis. And we just happen to be uh, situated where Princeton is in the heart of eight or nine or 10 other licensed uh, premises being very close to us, where most of them send their testing down to the coast, into the interior, or 
uh, out to Toronto and we feel that our state-of-the-art lab where we've got capacity, it's another way that we'd be able to generate revenue and provide a great service. So the last one I want to leave you with is our, our cap table and basically just showing you cash on hand, sort of where we're at with our common shares, existing warrants that we have, uh, certainly the 10 and the 40 cent, I think are certainly in striking price or striking range. 125, well, hey, uh, predicated on how we grow and uh, continue to evolve our story in the coming year. I would say never say never because those don't expire until uh, later next year. And when you look at it, it's actually fairly clean. The overall cap table, we're in a strong position that we don't feel we need to go to the market anytime soon. And really our, our growth and premise is gonna be based on uh, organically grown revenue, no pun intended. And that uh, we, we hope to keep reporting back with uh, stories of how we're doing, how we're growing and uh, changing lives. Dane, anything you wanna add before we open it up to the Q&A? No, yeah, I just, um, I think we've all, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with, um, you know, shareholders over the last, you know, three, four months and, um, you know, the support from them has been, has been good. You know, they, they, the, the market's really shifted towards fundamentals, I think a little earlier than, um, you know, we had, we had seen. So, yeah, it's exciting. And I think that, um, you know, it's a time for us to deliver and, and um, you know, generate some revenue for everybody.